Hello and welcome to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast, a resilience podcast where we talk about all the challenging things that we're working to overcome like anxiety, health and relationship issues. My name is Sarah. Welcome to the latest episode of the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. I'm Sarah, your host this week. I am excited to be back this week. I did take last week off. I typically uh, do an episode every week and I recently realized that maybe some weeks I need to give myself a break. So I took the Easter long weekend off and really enjoyed it. I had a number of things to do over the weekend and so it was definitely needed to just take a little podcast pause. So that's what I did. I'm calling this some maturity for myself in realizing that maybe I cannot do every single little thing. I love to always believe that like I can fit it in, you know, I can always fit in another workout, fit in another task, fit in um, doing different things. But I'm starting to realize that I don't have to and that sometimes I should probably take more breaks. So that's what I did. Uh, We're moving along in spring here in Ontario, Canada. Things are getting a little bit nicer. We had some decent weather over the Easter break. A little bit of snow last week, which was odd, but um, that does tend to happen. You get this April snow and it didn't stick and I was really happy about that. This week, we have a really exciting interview. We're going to be talking with Melissa Schwartz, who is an author, a speaker, a coach, and a podcaster, and focusing on highly sensitive children and parenting highly sensitive children. So we know that parenting is one of the most wonderful and challenging roles that uh, we have in our lives, and it can be particularly challenging if you parent a highly sensitive child or children. So I am speaking with author, speaker, and co-host of Leading Edge Parenting Podcast, Melissa Schwartz. She is going to give us information about what she's learned about parenting highly sensitive children. And honestly, I found this really insightful. We talk through what it is to be highly sensitive, and I can see myself in the description that she gives. I can see some of my uh, traits of my children definitely in those descriptions. Um, She also talks about what issues can arise when you are raising a highly sensitive child and then tools that we can use to support us. Um, I think it's a, a really different episode in that it was something that I really wasn't that familiar with and it's, it's made me rethink a lot of things since. So you're definitely not going to want to miss this one. And I hope that you enjoy this episode talking with Melissa Schwartz. So welcome, Melissa, to the podcast. I'm happy to connect with you today. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah. So, you know, Sarah, whenever people ask me that question, I always say I was born into this work. (laughs) Um, I've been professionally coaching parents of highly sensitive children for a little over a decade, but I was born highly sensitive and intense. And both of my parents uh, were educators in their careers. And so um, because they understood child development and I'm the younger of two children, I have an older brother who was hardwired, really easygoing they assume that there was something wrong with me because life was always so intense and so overwhelming and my emotions always felt so big. And so a lot of my childhood, I really felt misunderstood. Um, You know, I went through sort of academic testing to try and figure out what the it was about me that was different. And it really took until my adult years when um, my parents both retired from their careers, they moved to California where I live now. My mom started doing workshops for parents. And the parents that would come to parenting workshops typically have kids like me. You know, if you have an easygoing child who behaves, you're usually not going to a parenting workshop. And when my mom would talk about her experiences raising my easygoing older brother and raising me who was challenging and difficult is the language that's often used. Um, Parents would come up to me at the end of the the workshops and say, you sound just like my child. Can I talk to you? And so I actually started coaching parents of highly sensitive children before I even heard about the term high sensitivity because the common challenges, the 
big behaviors, the things that were so difficult for me and for them all kind of overlapped. And so I've now been doing this work for, like I said, for a little bit over a decade. Um, I've written a couple of books. I do a lot of public speaking. And I'm just really passionate about educating adults about high sensitivity. Because if you live or work with a highly sensitive child and you can't figure out what's going on with them, you might be looking to see what's wrong, looking for a diagnostic, a diagnosis. But once you understand what high sensitivity looks like, you're much more inclined to look at them through a new perspective. And once you've got some tools to help them, these kids can really thrive. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And and that's a great background for everybody to understand. Um, And I can see like, when you're mentioning sort of some of the questions that you had, that it can be challenging for parents too, because especially if it's their first child, that's highly sensitive, they just think, okay, this is parenting. And then, you know, maybe you get the second child and they are have that different um, demeanor and, and different ways of, of being. And so then all of a sudden you start to notice that, that differentiation. So maybe you can just dig right into what is meant by the term highly sensitive children and what kind of makes a child fit that category? Like, how do you know if you have one? Yeah, what a great question. So, so, you know, it's sort of actually difficult to answer to some degree because every child's behavior looks different. And, um, you know, in part, high sensitivity, it is a, a temperament trait. It is a genetic um, way of, it, it's genetically passed down. It's a certain way of experiencing life, but the way that high sensitivity looks in children can be different. So um, when I answer this question, I always like to, to go back to Elaine Aaron as the source and use her definition. So Elaine Aaron is sort of like the modern grandmother of the movement. Um, Carl Jung was actually one of the first people to use the term highly sensitive, but Elaine Aaron did a lot of research in the 90s. And she's written many, many books. And um, and the way that she likes to um, describe high sensitivity is using an acronym of D-O-E-S. And what that means is um, there are sort of four qualities that are found in every highly sensitive person. So I'm going to briefly run through them and then I'll, and I'll um, apply it to, to how you can tell if, if a child has it. So the D stands for deep processing or depth of processing. And it means that highly sensitive people need to process process things deeply, whether it's a movie that you take a child to and they have a million questions, or it's a book that they've read and they want to understand why the character did what it did, or it's something that happened at school that was maybe upsetting and they want to really understand what was going on. We have this innate nature of processing things on a really deep level. The O stands for overstimulation or over arousal, which means that we can become overwhelmed by our sensory experience, by our emotional experience. And we actually really need that downtime to process, to be able to un- unfill our basket, if you will, right? To kind of empty ourselves of all of the sensory stimuli, all of the emotional, intellectual things that we take in during the day. Otherwise, we can reach a tipping point more easily the non-highly sensitive people where we might have a tantrum or a breakdown just because we're feeling overwhelmed by what's been going on for us. The E in this um, in this acronym stands for emotional saturation or empathy. And what that means is that as highly sensitive people, we have a broader range of emotions. One of the ways that I like to think about that is if a non-highly sensitive person's emotions were like a crayon box, um, they would have like an eight pack with the primary colors and the primary emotions. But the highly sensitive person has that, that giant box of crayons, like 164 crayons, where we have more nuanced emotions, more nuanced shades of colors, and we feel things in a more saturated way. So we've got the neon crayons and the glitter crayons and and we feel joy and elation in ways that non-highly sensitive people don't that's one of like the upsides of being highly sensitive yes we feel those unwanted emotions in a bigger way but those positive delicious emotions really show up in a more saturated way for us as well and we also have a lot of empathy so as highly sensitive people we can usually 
put ourselves in other people's shoes um, on, a, on a biological level, we have more mirror neurons in our brains. So we're more able to resonate with other people's experiences when we see them either upset or really joyful. We can really tap into that. And then the S in this acronym stands for sensing subtleties. And that means we'll notice things that other people might not notice, whether it's on a, a smaller level, like, huh, the pillows are arranged differently on the sofa, or did you change your hair color all the way up to, um, you know, a child might walk into a room and feel some discord. Maybe um, mom and dad just had an argument in the room, or they might walk into a room where other children have been playing and they feel a lightness and, and kind of a joy. So those four qualities, the deep processing, the overstimulation, the emotional saturation and sensing subtleties are really the four innate qualities that we find in a highly sensitive person. Beyond that, things like introversion and extroversion can really vary. But whenever somebody's got those DOES qualities, chances are pretty good that they're highly sensitive. Okay, so and then given that we're going by qualities that way, I can kind of imagine that like no two children look maybe appear the same as in terms of highly sensitive, right? It could be a different combination of, of different things that they're expressing. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. Um, so definitely I can see even a lot of myself in that. And so I'm wondering if maybe based on what you've just went through in terms of the, um, the category, mm -hmm. what are some of the issues then that you see arise for children and, and that we should maybe be aware of as parents? Yeah. So, you know, one of the biggest issues for highly sensitive children is that overstimulation or over arousal. That's usually when children tend to have tantrums and pushback. And usually when parents come to me, they'll say, you know, I don't know, the smallest thing will set him or her off. You know, the um, the TV was on too loud, or I asked her to put on um, her dance leotard, or I told him to put his shoes on, and a child falls apart. And that's usually because they're already teetering on over arousal or overstimulation. What I mean when I use those words is, um, you know, if you think about like a bucket, it can only hold so much water, right? And so if, if that bucket is nearly full, and then you add a few more drops to it, it will start to overflow. And so with sensitive children, very often um, the metaphorical straw that breaks them doesn't look like that big of a deal from the outside, but it's really because they've been holding so much in and they've really been holding it together for a long time that then they just tend to fall apart. And that's why that downtime for processing that, um, you know, quiet time being built into the day is really, really helpful for sensitive kids. And Another challenge that shows up there is that sensitive children usually can't tell when they're teetering on over arousal. They really need our help to identify kind of patterns in their day and look for opportunities to help them slow it down and empty out their buckets before they get too full. Because otherwise, something tiny like... Um, no, we can't have pizza for dinner can be an absolute breakdown, right? And you might, as a parent, be thinking, I did everything for you today. I took you to the park and we did this and we did that and we did all these fun things. And now because I said no pizza, you're falling apart. But really it's because they were just on the edge of this overstimulation. And that one last no is what pushed them you know, into, into a breakdown. So one of the biggest challenges usually comes around this over arousal, overstimulation, not having enough time to process. But the other place where it tends to show up is around navigating emotions. Highly sensitive children feel things in a really big way. And so when they're upset or frustrated or angry or disappointed, that can also end up in a really big tantrum. So, so you can imagine tantrums are not uncommon for highly sensitive children and not even for highly sensitive adults. You know, when, when we become adults, but we haven't really learned how to navigate our emotions, we might have our own adult tantrums where we really struggle to deal with our overstimulation, with our disappointment or upset, because if we didn't learn how to do it when we were children, we're not automatically going to have the tools for it as adults either. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like a lot of um, trying to support our children as as they're working through this. So what kind of tools do you see work best? So say if you were to look at that overstimulation example, mm -hmm. um, what what are you recommending to clients or parents in terms of, of how to best help our child through that? So one of the most effective things which can be challenging is to catch it before we get there, right? It's sort of like um, if you have a child who gets hangry, giving them a snack before they need it, but we can't always do that, right? Sometimes the best we can do is deal with the, the effect once we realize how we've gotten there. So with children that become overstimulated, What's really, really helpful is to validate their experience. And by that, I mean saying things to them like, this is really hard for you, or you look really upset, or it looks like this really matters. What parents will sometimes do with the best of intentions, but in, in a less effective way, is say things like, why are you making such a big deal about that? It doesn't really matter. You know, brush it off and let it go or toughen up about it. And what that does is it actually adds to the child's overwhelm and, and adds to their upset because they don't feel understood. They don't feel seen. And so they might push even harder to try and justify why they feel the way that they feel. Now, if we're talking about young children, you know, like four and under, they hardly have the language skills to express what's going on. So what's really, really helpful for those kids is if we can act like their inner monologue. So for example, if you say to your three or four year old, it's time for us to leave the playground and go home to have lunch, and they get really upset, you could say something to them like, it looks like you're feeling really upset that it's time to go home. In other words, giving them the language that you wish they had in that moment actually giving them the exact words that they could use the next time something like that happens. Mommy, I'm so upset. It's time to go home. And then we can talk with them about it. I get it. It was really fun being here. I can understand why you're upset having to leave and stop, stop the fun that we were doing to go home and just have lunch that feels so boring, something like that. So when we can actually model for young, highly sensitive children, what to do with their emotions, how to express them in more appropriate ways. That is one of the most helpful things that we can do because sort of two reasons. One, it eliminates or really diminishes the tantrums that they have in their younger years. But more than that, it teaches them what to do with their emotions. So once they grow up and they're adults, they actually know what to do with their uncomfortable emotions. They don't have to run away from them or deny them or stuff them down or, you know, turn to things outside of themselves to numb those emotions because they've learned how to express them in appropriate ways, how to speak up for themselves in ways where they can be heard rather than expressing their emotions through hysteria and upset and, you know, crying and screaming and trying to manipulate to get their needs met. All of those are really just survival tactics for a child who hasn't yet learned how to express their emotions properly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, so modeling and then trying to make sure that they feel understood. And I guess it's making me think a little bit further down the line. So, you know, if they aren't maybe taught those coping mechanisms or different ways to, um, to work through it as an adult, what does a highly sensitive person look like at, say, a tween or teen level or at an adult level? What are some of the issues that you see coming up as they as this child? Yeah, so children who haven't learned what to do with those emotions will usually struggle to some degree or another. You know, they might, they might struggle in their friendships and relationships. They might um, sort of turn to less healthy ways of having relationships. You know, they might um, experiment with drugs and alcohol. They might find themselves in in relationships where they're um, showing up for people in ways that don't really feel good for them, but they want to be liked. You know, a, a child who learns to speak up for themselves, to um, share their emotions in a in a healthy way, is really learning how to advocate for their needs and how to tell people what they're expecting in the way that they're being treated. 
You know, when children don't learn how to do that, they might find themselves in relationships that don't feel great. Um, they might find themselves in situations where they acquiesce because they want to be liked. Um, they might find themselves feeling really antisocial and really shut down. You know, the last couple of years with COVID have made it easier for us to kind of stay in our homes and not really be out in the world. And so if a highly sensitive tween or teen isn't feeling good about themselves, they can really just kind of hide away these days. You know, it's become really um, practical just to kind of stay home and, and stay in your room. Um, these are also people who are going to not feel great. You know, one of the things that makes a highly sensitive person feel alive is being connected to other people and having really authentic relationships. They might not need a lot of them, but they're going for quality relationships. And so um, if you have a, a highly sensitive child and they've only got like one or two good friends, don't be alarmed. Be grateful that they've got one or two good friends. You know, me personally, some of my best friends that I have are still from childhood. My, you know, one of my best friends I've known since I was four. Um, and so we tend to hang on to relationships for a long time. So um, if you can encourage a highly sensitive child to be able to share their truth with people, and if they can trust that they are being seen and accepted for who they are, they're going to do okay. If they don't feel like they're understood, like they have people that they can count on and talk to, they could get into some trouble in their older years. You know, they might become either reclusive or hang out with the wrong crowd. Um, you know, earlier when we were talking about sort of the traits of high sensitivity, um, there's a split of introversion and extroversion. Approximately 70% of highly sensitive people are introverts and the other 30 are extroverts. And then there's another split that I like to talk about, which is around high sensation seeking. And this might seem a little counterintuitive to high sensitivity, but sensation seekers, which about 30% of highly sensitive people are, are people who like trying new things, being a little risky, having new and novel experiences. These are people who might dabble in drug use when they get older because they're looking for a unique experience. They're looking to try things that are a little more exciting and different as opposed to the non-sensation seekers who kind of like predictability and um, consistent experiences. So if you have a sensation seeking highly sensitive child who's really struggling, we want to do our best to get in there and support them before their teen years because we don't want them to look to these kind of outside of themselves experiences to find joy and excitement. We want them to be able to be able to tap into it on their own, to find it in their own inner resource. Okay, that's great. That's that's kind of exactly what I was thinking is that you could see this maybe progression as this moves along. Um, and so what kind of tools, I guess, would you suggest um, for an older child? I mean, you've talked about modeling in the case of a younger child, trying to give them the language. Is it moving more towards like therapy um, in terms of being able to, to have that talk um, or are there other tools that you would recommend? Yeah, I think therapy is wonderful for highly sensitive people in general. Um, there's this idea of what's called differentiated susceptibility in highly sensitive people, which says that if we we meaning us as highly sensitive people, if we're raised in an environment where we're seen and understood and nurtured, we are going to thrive even beyond our non highly sensitive counterparts, which is great news. And if we are in an environment where we're not understood, not nurtured, not validated, not given the tools that we need, we're going to suffer even more than our non highly sensitive counterparts. And those are the people who really deserve to go to therapy because once they have the opportunity to learn these tools, they're going to get right back on track. They're just, you know, if, if a highly sensitive person is struggling, it's not because anything's wrong with them. It's really because they're sort of missing a couple of important components and understanding themselves. And so if you have a teen who you think is having a hard time, I think therapy is a great option. Finding a mentor, getting them involved in an internship or volunteer opportunities, you know, doing things that they love 
sensitive people usually are drawn to animals and nature and young children, you know, we have that, that strong empathy. And so um, helping a helping a teenager get involved, where they can give back, or they can be around other people that have similar interests, whether it's um, arts or, you know, acting, dancing, um, all of these sort of creative expressions usually resonate with highly sensitive people. But one of the other things that adults that parents of of highly sensitive children that are listening can do is share from your own experience with your children. You know, highly sensitive teens really appreciate vulnerability in adults. They like knowing that their parents aren't perfect. They like knowing that their parents aren't infallible, that they've made mistakes too. And so if you have a teenager who's struggling, you might sit with yourself and say, you know, what went on for me that my now child will resonate with? And share some stories. Let them know that you've struggled also, you know, open up to them because that's usually what's going to give them the permission and the freedom to get vulnerable with you. Most of the time, what sensitive teens really need is a non judgmental ear to listen and somebody who will validate their experience, who will help them understand that they're not alone in the way that they're feeling. They're not alone in feeling a little different, a little kind of outside of center, because sensitive people are hardwired in a different way. You know, we we typically recognize that there's something different about us than others, but we can't always put our finger on it. And highly sensitive people are about 20% of the population. So it's like one in five of us are highly sensitive and and we're usually drawn to other sensitive people. So once you start talking to your teen or tween about um, what it might be to be highly sensitive, they'll probably identify it in some of their peers and be able to have conversation and and see themselves in others and, and begin to resonate with people that are having a similar kind of experience. Even that in, in and of itself will be really soothing for them to know that there's nothing wrong, they're not alone, there are plenty of other people who are just like them. Okay. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. And then, you know, kind of be able to find, find their people, you know, that they can, they can be with. Um, So I guess I'm thinking if we flip this around more from the child perspective to the parent perspective, Mm -hmm. I can imagine that it could be challenging for the parent, um, even energy wise to be maybe parenting in this way, parenting a highly sensitive child. Um, So I'm just wondering if you have suggestions for parents in what they can do to support themselves um, while they're then supporting their child. Yes, it can be exhausting being the parent of a highly sensitive child. You know, when I'm working with parents, that's usually one of the things that they're struggling with the most because it's very hard to be... um, you know, to not be in that over arousal yourself when you're parenting one, if not more highly sensitive children. You know, it's it's hard enough being an adult. It's hard enough being a parent, but adding sensi- high sensitivity to the mix can, can really amp things up. So one of the things that I always encourage parents to do is to set up time, whether it's five or 10 minutes in the mornings before you wake up your kids. If you work out of the house, taking a few minutes in your car before you go inside, um, looking for little opportunities in the day where you can reconnect with yourself, where you can empty out your own bucket a little bit. Um, It's very, very, very difficult to be loving and present and non-judgmental of your children when you're teetering on the edge of your own overwhelm. So the more that you can do to take care of yourself as a parent, even if you're just carving out these few moments here and there, the the more you can model um, how to how to handle your own sensitivity for your children. One more thing that I think is really, really important here. Um, I worked with a mom a couple of years ago who's highly sensitive and, and has a highly sensitive daughter. And at the time, her daughter was about three or four years old. And, and mom was sharing this story with me that one day mom was in the kitchen and feeling totally overwhelmed, you know, between work and bills and family obligations. And um, mom was making lunch and the little girl walked in the kitchen and she said, mommy, are you happy? And mommy turned to her and said, yes, I'm happy. And I said to mom, 
but were you happy? And she said, no, I was totally frazzled and overwhelmed. And, but I didn't want my daughter to know how I was feeling. You know, I wanted to protect her. And I, as lovingly and compassionately as I could, helped her to see that when we aren't honest about our emotions with our children, what we do is we, we create some uh, confusion for them. We actually create a lot of confusion for them. One, we teach them how to misidentify what's going on in other people. You know, when that little girl walked in the room, she could probably sense that her mom was overwhelmed and stressed and had too much on her plate. And that's why she asked because she could pick up on the tension and mom didn't want to burden her. You know, mom wants to try and protect her daughter. But in doing that, she's teaching her daughter that the the empathic quality she has when she's tapping into what's going on for other people is off. In other words, when that little girl was feeling overwhelmed and stress and too much to do, mom was calling that happy. It's sort of like showing a little kid a red crayon and calling it purple. It's, it's, it's going to set up some confusion for them. And so instead what I coached this particular mom to do was to begin to talk about her emotional state with her job, with her daughter and then show her what to do about it. So for example, in that situation, mom could turn to the daughter and say, actually, I'm not feeling happy. I'm feeling very overwhelmed. I have too much to do and not enough time. <sighs> I don't like this feeling. So I think what I need to do is just take a two minute break. I'm going to take a little break. I'm going to get some nice cold water. I'm going to go stand outside. I'm going to look at the clouds. I'm going to take a few deep breaths. And then I'm going to come back in and try to tackle all of the things that I have to do again. In other words, really modeling for this little girl what the emotions look like and what we do with them when we're feeling them. I think a lot of us as parents tend to protect our children from the way that we're feeling because we don't want them to have to feel it. But all that does is keep them from learning what to do with it. It, te- it. it teaches them to kind of stuff their feelings down or hide from their feelings. And that's going to set up a lot of confusion for them down the road. And, and it's, it's actually kind of setting them up to need therapy, to be able to work through identifying and expressing their emotions. So one of the best things you can do if you're a parent of a highly sensitive child, be honest with them model for them. Tell them how you're feeling. Show them what you do when you're not feeling great. Give yourself a break. Take time in your day. Do what you need to do to get yourself into a better emotional state and then move forward in interacting with them as best as you can. You know, we can't do it all of the time and there's no need to be perfect in this. And the more that you can do it, the better. Yeah, that's really interesting. And and I can appreciate, I guess, how that vulnerability and then being honest would be helpful for them. I always, I do worry myself, like, you know, you don't want to burden them. You also want to make sure you have those firm boundaries. But then, mm-hmm. yeah, I think you can do it, as you're saying, in a way where, you know, you're showing, you're kind of giving them the tools that you're using. So that's interesting. Yeah. And in age appropriate ways, right? You know, right. the conversation you're going to have with your four year old when she comes in the kitchen versus your 14 year old are going to be different. You can be a little more transparent with your older children about what's going on and talk to them. You know, you might even say something like I overcommitted, you know, mm-hmm. I, I signed up for this um, volunteer position or I took on too much at work or I told grandma and grandpa they could come for this weekend. And now I'm stressed getting the house clean and food prepared. And I took on too much. I think I I should have said no somewhere along the way, which is not the conversation that you're going to have with your four-year-old. But with your older children, you can be a little more transparent with them about what's going on. No, that's great. And, you know, you did mention sometimes that people are parenting multiple highly sensitive children. Is that common where you're, you've maybe got several children, especially if you're a highly sensitive person yourself? Yeah, it, you know, it's funny that you asked that. 
usually when there's a highly sensitive child, parents tend to stop. You know, because it can be so overwhelming. Um, but there are absolutely families where there are multiple highly sensitive children. And it's not uncommon to have a family where you've got, let's say, three or four children and only one is highly sensitive. Um, mm. So it's, you know, it's a kind of a hit or miss thing when you're having children. There's no way to know if you're going to have a highly sensitive child, but it is a genetic trait that gets passed down. So if one parent is highly sensitive, there is a chance that you're going to have a highly sensitive child. Um, in my coaching practice, I actually work with a lot of families that have adopted children because when non highly sensitive parents adopt a highly sensitive child, they're usually at a loss about what is going on for this child because neither of them can really tap into the experience. But more common is when um, birth parents, you know, genetic parents have children for them to one of them usually really identifies with what's going on. Um, so it's all kind of a toss of the dice. There's no rhyme or reason to the way that it shows up in kids. So the more children you have, the higher chance you have of having multiple highly sensitive children. Okay, that's interesting. And I didn't realize that. So it is like a genetic thing. I know you said you can see it by looking at different qualities and the DOES piece, but so it is something that's genetic. It is. It's a genetic trait that gets passed down. Sometimes it'll skip a generation. You know, sometimes there are grandparents that are highly sensitive, but neither parent are. But more commonly is we'll see it in each generation. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Um, and I like that you've also talked about some of the positive pieces that, you know, you can experience um, a more range in positive emotions as well. And, you know, that it isn't all just negative. I think sometimes people hear highly sensitive and, and that's kind of how it's perceived. But I, I like that you're talking about even some of the areas that maybe um, – these children can find their interests like dancing or the environment or volunteering, acting, things like that. Um, I think that's great for parents to be aware of all of those really positive things that they can um, relate to their child. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I like to use the, um, the metaphor of a race car to describe a highly sensitive child and like a, a Prius or a minivan to describe a non highly sensitive child. The, the sports car, it is going to take more maintenance, more investment, more time, more energy. But if all of its needs are met, it is the most fun car on the road. And, you know, even a, a really well maintained Prius it's not as much fun as a really well-maintained Porsche, you know? Yeah. Um, in fact, I wrote a children's book that came out last year called Rico the Race Car, where the the protagonist of the story is a race car who struggles, you know? He, he notices more bumps on the road. He's more aware of the mud on his tires than his non-highly sensitive counterparts. But what he also realizes is that there are all of these cool things that come in with, with being a race car. And it, the same is true for a highly sensitive child. You know, um, yes, we can have more intense experiences in life, but the intense joy and elation and kindness and um, ingenuity and sense of humor and, and cleverness that highly sensitive children bring is unparalleled by their non highly sensitive counterparts. No, that's great. That's great to highlight. So as I was poking around a little bit on your website, I did notice something that I thought was really interesting called the parent cleanse. I wondered mm -hmm. if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, yeah. I love it. Um, so the parent cleanse is a 21-day move-at-your-own-pace course that my mom and I created for parents to really help clean out all of the gunk in the way that you're thinking about your children. You know, we we do – I live in California, so, you know – out here, cleanses are kind of a <laughs> common part of conversation, but we'll do a cleanse to clean out our body, right? And kind of do a mm -hmm. reset and get rid of all of the, the toxins and things. But our minds can be really toxic places, you know? And if you have a highly sensitive child who's in school um, and you've been struggling with them for a long time, you probably are unconsciously thinking some toxic thoughts about them. You know, we get in these these thought habits and thought patterns that don't really serve us. So the parent cleanse that we created, um, it, it offers prompts and 
practices for parents to sort of clean out the way that they're thinking about their children and their families and um, deliberately set up some new ways of looking at things so that there can be more harmony, more joy, more connection in their homes. Oh, wow. That sounds really great. Um, So if you're somebody that's just kind of feeling like this is what you need, um, then, then that's something to check out. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a great resource. So I wondered um, if there are any other tools or advice that you kind of wanted to give around parenting or mention to listeners before we get into wrapping up. You know, the, the biggest tool that I like to give parents is to be easy on yourselves. I think that we can often become um, like too wrapped up in comparing how children are doing to other children. And the truth is that each child is a really unique being. You know, they have their unique hard wiring, their, their unique place in the family. Um, each family has got its own set of circumstances. And what they really need the most and deserve the most is to be seen and loved and appreciated for exactly who they are. So if you're listening and you're you know, getting ready to go be with your children, see if you can take a minute or two before you go to be with them and remember the joy you felt the first time you held them in your arms. You know, Think about some of the sweetest moments that you've had with them and recognize that that is who their, their innate nature is. That's who they're really meant to be. You know, their, their goal is not to drive you crazy. It's not to be annoying. It's not to argue with their siblings. It's, it's not to um, behave in a way to make you proud. It's to really allow them to grow into the being that they're meant to be so that they can go out into the world and be of service to themselves and others. And so be easy on yourself, be easy on them. Um, try and drop the comparison. It's too easy these days to look at what's going on for somebody else, especially with social media, when we're able to just portray the positive aspects of what's going on and not really get the full picture of what's going on behind closed doors. And these days, kids are feeling immense pressure. You know, there's a lot of stressful stuff going on in the air. They're picking up on scary things in the news. They're kind of hearing little bits and pieces of adult conversation about about COVID and war and all of these very traumatizing things. And so give them a, a little bit of a break. Let them know that you love and appreciate them for exactly who they are and that they don't have to measure up to anybody outside of themselves. Um, highly sensitive people do really, really well when they stop comparing themselves to other people and instead they use how they're growing as a metric, you know, who they used to be and who they are now, how, how difficult life felt and how much easier it feels now, Um, how big my emotions, how intense my emotions used to be and how under control my emotions feel now. Those are the metrics that we want to use. Um, So, so my, 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 I want to say my most helpful tip is to stop looking outside of who your child is for any metric of who they should be. That makes a ton of sense. I really like that. I, you know, it's not something that we talked about yet, but that comparison piece for sure. Like if you, even as a parent are sitting there and you're think, you know, what somebody else is doing as a parent, and then you're feeling that like, how come it's so challenging for me, right? Like, I can see it that way. And then also, yeah, there's, there's the comparison around the child um, as well. And, and yeah, it just, it's not a good place to end up in for sure. And and so I really like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's helpful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, that's great. So I mean, I know you mentioned your book, and we talked a little bit about the parent cleanse. But how can listeners find out more about you on social media online? What are the best ways to connect with you? Yeah, so I am um, mostly on Facebook in terms of social media. Um, I have a group for parents of highly sensitive children. And just look up highly sensitive children and you'll find our group. I also have a Facebook page for parents of highly sensitive children where I'm always posting about workshops and I share all sorts of videos and podcasts and things like that. Lots of free resources. But the best place to go is our website. Um, the, the business my mom and I run is called Leading Edge 
parenting. And we always say we are on the leading edge of, of helping parents raise children. Highly sensitive people are leading edge thinkers and creators and beings. And so um, you go to leadingedgeparenting.com. It has links to all of our social media stuff, tons and tons of free resources. And you can get in touch with me through that website. Also, I offer a free coaching session for all new clients. So if you heard something today, you want to talk with me, ask me a question about your family's specifics, you can go ahead and schedule it right through the website. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Melissa. This has been so helpful. And I think um, listeners are really going to have picked up a lot, especially if they were thinking that maybe their child is highly sensitive. This should, should really help them with that. So I appreciate your time today. And thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Sarah. Total pleasure. Have you read my novel Pendulum by S.E. German yet? If not, what are you waiting for? And if you have, I would love to hear from you. If you don't know about Pendulum, it's a heartwarming story about a young boy who starts to experience neuropsychiatric symptoms after an infection. We follow the boy as he goes through many regular, real middle grade issues like moving, having a crush, playing sports, also while experiencing neuropsychiatric symptoms like anxiety, OCD, tics, panic attacks, and more. If you're interested in checking out Pendulum by S.E. German, it is available through Amazon Worldwide, where you can even see a preview of the book, or you can listen to chapter one, which is on episode 64 of the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. I hope you enjoy the novel, and thanks for your support. Thank you so much to Melissa Schwartz from Leading Edge Parenting for the conversation that we had on the podcast. I thought this was so great just to further understand what a highly sensitive child is and then what that means in terms of as parents. How do we relate to them? How do we really foster um, all the great things that go along with them to make them be as comfortable as possible? And I thought it was really interesting when she even described what it could look like for for teens and tweens and then even adults like this is where I really could see myself she mentioned like one to two good friends you know and that that's enough for them and 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 that's how I am I'm not like I have a million friends I'm I'm really um highly tuned into certain people that are are good friends so I really liked uh, her description there, and then some of the things that she talked about that could be helpful. A lot of the tools sounded like they made a lot of sense to me. And I think it's just a matter from what she was saying, of looking at things a little differently and and just not in a non judgmental way. And then working with your child to give them that best best footing that they can have and to support them in the best way that you can. So I I really liked her messages there. If you are looking for more information from Melissa, she did mention the Facebook group. So the group for parents um, of highly sensitive children. She mentioned her book, Rico the Race Car, as well. I think you can find all of this out on the leadingedgeparenting.com website and, of course, the podcast, Leading Edge Parenting Podcast. Hopefully, this was helpful. If you did enjoy this episode, I'd love for you to share it. I would love to hear from you if this is the kind of episode that you look forward to on the podcast. It really helps me in terms of future programming and being able to know what everybody's interested in. We've got some other great episodes coming up, including Parenting Your LGBTQIA Plus Teen, um, as well as other really insightful and interesting episodes. I hope that you'll tune in for future episodes and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. Please keep in mind, this podcast is not intended to be medical or professional advice. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can follow me on social media, Instagram and TikTok at Sarah Lady Gluten or Facebook, Sarah underscore Gluten Free Lady. You can also visit my website, which includes author information, speaking information, and more info on the podcast at www.se.com hyphen german.com. 
If you like the podcast, please feel free to review the podcast on your favorite platform and also subscribe because it means that it will show up for you every week on your favorite podcast platform. Also, we've just started to have the ability to support the podcast. You can find this link in my Instagram bio or visit Kofi, K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash learning to slay the beasts. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.